Good morning, everybody. So, so, so um, it's called Getting Through the Challenge. Um, I think the first challenge for you is that I'm going to race through my life. So sit back, fasten your seatbelts, and <laughs> explore between us some of the challenges that I've faced. And I hope they resonate. Well, I shouldn't say I hope they resonate. But if any of them do resonate with you, um, let's see. So Helen has said, read, read. So this is a, a good slide to start with. Um, time's a little bit short, so all, all I'm hoping is that you've heard of both of these books, Philomena, Think Ireland, Think of um, Single Woman, Pregnant, Religion, Stigma, Trauma. And um, have you heard of President Obama? Yeah, so you might get what the other one's about. So let's move on. So this is the Who Do You Think You Are bit about my mother's side of the family, which, as the title says, Liverpool Irish Working Class Heritage. When I was researching my memoirs, I was very keen to find out who were the emigrants and where, when um, did they come over from Ireland. And um, uh, if any of you follow Twitter, you, hopefully you've seen my Twitter account, but even if you don't, uh, and you're interested in a really good, uh, I think it's about half an hour or more, or maybe 15 minutes podcast that came out this week from Radio 4 about the Great Irish Famine, please, please do um, get onto it. It's, it's, I don't know how long it's up for, but it really is illuminating. So my, my, uh, I got back to 1840 and... Um, the families were from County Wexford and County Down. And you can see the impact of um, one of the occupations from Ireland, which was uh, seafaring in terms of my late uncle, who followed in, in that tradition, and also the impact of Catholicism, as one of my aunts was a nun. And that's my mother as a toddler. Let's move on quickly. Here she is. Around 18 years of age, she was an extremely bright child. She um, was the first in her family to go to university. The family had now moved from Liverpool to Stafford, so not too far away from here. And uh, she won a scholarship uh, to study classics at the University of Cambridge. So one can only imagine how um, thrilled everybody was about this. And she was doing extremely well normally then ask you to participate in this bit, but time's going on, so I'll tell you. I, won't, I, won't. I usually say, well, so what? What happened? Well, oh, we have to bring the religion back in. What happened was that my um, mother uh, fell pregnant towards the end of the second year of her studies and was so shamed about this, could not bring herself to tell her, very religious, very devout, um, parents, particularly her grandmother who went to church every day. And it was uh, her mother that was making a skirt for her and came to the fitting and was horrified when she realised that my mother was pregnant. She was about six months pregnant at this time. Horrified, she asked my mother, was she pregnant? My mother said yes. When was she going to tell her parents? My mother said, I wasn't. I was going to go down to the river, jump in and kill myself because of the shame that she knew, um, uh, you know, all the dreams shattered. Now, unlike the um, trauma that Philomena went through at the hands of the church, I'm afraid, um, this didn't happen for my mother, maybe because my grandfather, who, after serving in the First World War, joined the, um, well, passed the civil service exams and became a customs and excise officer. So the social mobility upwards had started in the family. And he was very friendly with the local parish priest. And it was to the priest that he went to to seek urgent advice and support about this absolute dreadful experience now. And the first thing was, um, was you know, God forbid, how do we prevent the neighbors from finding out that my daughter is pregnant? So we, we have to think of the mores, the attitudes just after the Second World War, the middle class area of Stafford where they were living. So the church 
uh, rallied round and organised for my mother in the dark of night to uh, go to a mother and baby home in Birmingham run by Irish nuns. The next thing was, what, what are they going to tell the university? And um, so this, this story has been passed down um, in my family, and it was where I, I don't know whether I was a young adult, but then I just, you know, found out actually you can lie in the Catholic Church, but it, it's, it's as long as it's sanctioned by the church. Um, <laughs> because because what, the, what the priest said to the, my, my, my grandparents was, tell... Um, Newnham College that Maureen Mary, my, my mother, has had a nervous breakdown and she's gone to Ireland to recuperate with relatives. So that, that was that. Uh, and Newnham College said, fine, we, you know, she's a very bright student, we want to hold her place open. So that was that. So then the next uh, issue was, well, wh what's going to happen to the baby um, whilst my mum goes back to Cambridge to finish her, her degree? All my mother had said to her parents was that the father was a fellow student at Cambridge University. Ho hopefully you're getting the title of my memoirs. Mixed, blem mixed blessings from a Cambridge union. Get it? Do you like it? Yeah. <laughs> so um, so uh, that's all she told her parents. So my mother, uh, sorry, my, my grandmother, uh, originally suggested adoption, no, my mother flatly refused that. Fostering, no. And so then my grandmother said, you know something, I'm a bit plump. I don't know whether she actually said that, but she was a bit plump. Um, uh, let's tell the neighbours it's my baby. You, you know this sort of story. Plan A. So, uh, you're ahead of the game, all right. So, so the day arrived, I had been born in Birmingham, um, accompanied my mum back to the mother and baby home, run by Irish nuns. My grandparents uh, came to visit us, and the nun blocked their way into the room where we were, turned round to them and said, Ah, to be sure, the baby's a little dark. <laughs> Plan A is out of the window. <laughs> Plan B was, again, the church rallied round, well, we'll organise a cot in a, a, a Catholic children's home in Birmingham, short term, for the duration of my mother completing her degree. So you see the contrast with Philomena's experience is incredible, because they were, the church was really bending over backwards to help my family. <coughs> Excuse me. My mother then put the spanner in the works, because by this time, it's just... After the, a few years after the Second World War, and as you will know, at times of conflict, the birth rate goes up, both in marriage and particularly out with of marriage. And this was the case in this country and in the, in the, in the, in the Birmingham area. And the Catholic Church were not only impacted locally by the increase in demand for cots for children to be placed in the children's home, but also from women coming over from Ireland, because if you think the stigma was bad enough in the West Midlands just after the war, think of what it was like in Ireland and rural Ireland in particular. And that's where Philomena's story is, 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 is an example. So in fact, they thought it might take a couple of months for the cot to um, um, come, um, be found, and in fact it took six months. Now, obviously, what, what had happened was bonding, close bonding had occurred between myself and my mother, because that's when she turned around to the horror of everybody, the church included, and said, I'm not going back to Cambridge University. I'm not going to complete my degree. Um, I'm, I'll try and become a journalist, which she never did, but she, ended, she became a secretary. Uh, we'll talk about her life in a little bit more. So um, I ended up being in care for nine years, and in fact, this is one of the triggers for... When my friends and colleagues learnt that I'd been in care for this length of time in early childhood and some of the things that happened to me, both in care and outside of care, they really were shocked. They were saying, well, how, how, this isn't the narrative that we hear in the media about mixed-race children that are in care or whatever. You, you need to tell your story. How, how, did you, how did you succeed? How come you appear to be 
quite normal. You know, you, you never ended up in a psychiatric institute. You don't seem to have become addicted to drugs or anything. Tell your story, Elizabeth. So eventually, that's, that's what um, led me to do this. So just a few little um, pointers from this period. Uh, overall, actually, I was quite happy in, 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 in care. Um, it was where I decided I wanted to be a nurse because I had very bad eczema and I was also asthmatic. So I've just actually got over I'm recovering from a chesty cold. So if you hear a few wheezes, don't panic. I've got my inhaler somewhere. So, um, uh, uh, but I had very, very bad eczema. And, <coughs> excuse me, the, 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 I had to go to the sick bay quite often to get my dressings changed because in those days it was coal tar paste that used to be applied, really very cooling on your excoriated red, painful skin. Um, and then you'd have a bandage around your arms and knees as well. Um, I would actually peep around this sick bay door to see who, who was there, who's going to do the dressing. Was it the black nun or the white nun? Well, actually, they're all white nuns. But if I saw the white nun in a black habit, I'd run. And this is probably where I became a very good athlete in, in secondary school and represented my school, in fact. Because I don't think she did it deliberately, but she would just tear off the dressing. Now, coal tar paste is lovely when it goes on, but it dries and it, gets stick, it sticks to the bandage. So she would just tear off the bandage, and of course the skin would come off, it would bleed, it would be painful. I'd be bawling my head off, and I vowed as a child, no way was she ever going to get near to my bandages again. So fortunately, most times, it was the white nun. She was white, but she wore a white habit. And she used distraction therapy. If you were brought up in the, in the Catholic Church, we were taught to, uh, that nuns were the brides of Christ. They were very holy women. And yet, this nun would say what I thought as a small child were really rude words, such as bottom. <gasps> I'd burst out laughing, bandage off, didn't feel a thing. I actually thought she was the most wonderful woman on earth. Uh, I associated her with pain-free removal of dressings, to be quite honest. And I wanted to be like her. Not a nun, I lost my faith quite early on, but... I discovered she was a nurse. And it was the best career decision I actually made. So I'm very happy about that. However, there were some negative um, things. Now, time doesn't allow me to talk about a lot of them, but one I will tell you, which is the worst one, and that was how they treated children like myself who wet the bed. Um, we'd have an inspection in the morning in the dormitory, and the group of us that were the bedwetters knew what was happening. We would we'd just follow the annoyed nun, and she would ask us all to get on little chairs, drape our urine-soaked sheet over us. We had to then just put our arms like that underneath the sheet. And the punishment was not only that, but if you dropped your arm, she was at the other side with a ruler. And, and so, you, so, I mean, even as a child, I thought, that, that's, that's really cruel. None shouldn't be doing that. And it maybe is where the start of what I call anger in my belly started deep, deep down. But there were some good things. I, I learned Irish dancing, and I love that. So. so at nine years of age, my mother, I'll talk about my father in a minute. My mother had um, married an English guy. She'd never married my father. And um, they had got a council house uh, eventually in Wolverhampton. And I, 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 she brought me out of the convent at this, at this time. And uh, when I arrived, <coughs> excuse me, I had a half-brother at age three and another half-brother on the way. And I was to have two half-sisters. And I was always very close to my, my, my maternal siblings. But unfortunately, the time I stayed there only was for 20 months. And it was a very unhappy period. And the reason was that my stepfather had, was being teased by his mates down at the pub. We're in the 1950s now. And uh, what are you doing allowing your woman to have a half-caste child in the house? And unbeknown to my mother, behind her back, he started gradually tapping and then quite uh, severe physical abuse. The worst one in the last episode of was when he hit me so hard that I went flying across this small sitting room and hit my eyebrow on the hearth, burst open, blood um, screaming. My mother came running in from the kitchen. And it was the first realization what had been going on because I never told her what was happening. She was absolutely distraught, I'm sure. Um, it's a very traumatic period for me. I, I just don't remember 
uh, very much about it. Um, but my grandparents apparently had moved from the Midlands now back up to the northwest. And they, they were estranged from my mother. Um, they'd been very supportive, as, as you've seen. But my stepfather was a Protestant. And that was a no-go area, OK? But to be fair to my grandparents, when my mother, um, she must have gone outside and gone to the call box, because we didn't have a phone in the, in the house, and rang them and told them what had happened. My, my grandfather apparently came down and rescued me. Now, I was nearly 11, but I don't remember. I don't remember him picking me up. I don't remember the journey to Wallasey, just near Liverpool. So I think that indicates the trauma that I, I, I was experiencing. However, I, this is a happy period that then um, occurred during my adolescence when I was um, in, in Wallasey. I loved the school that I was at. My grandfather sadly died after 20 months ago. I was very close to my grandfather. I was very close to my grandmother, but gradually she, she got very depressed, I think, after the death of my grandfather. She was very dependent on him. They, they did have a very close relationship. So um, let's just look at this. Some of you may see this image. Um, the typical school photo. This is just a third of the photo. And I was the only pupil of colour, the only black pupil there. Had a whale of a time, thoroughly enjoyed my time. However, this could be a slide presentation about hair. Um, because nobody from childhood knew how to look after my hair. Didn't realise it needed to be oiled. The English combs were useless. Knit combs were even worse. <laughs> Um, so basically, I, I realised that all they were doing, which I followed on from, was getting a brush and just skimming it over the top of my head. So I would call my hair nappy at this stage. In other words, it wasn't really well groomed at all, but hey-ho. So let's move on. Oops. Why isn't it going? Oh, there we go. So I, I, I loved school. I, 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 the teachers um, liked me. I, 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 but I, so I was in lower sixth, and just the first few weeks in Lower Six, and my um, aunt, the junior sister of my, my mother, um, who was like a sister to me, um, had got married and gone to Ireland for her honeymoon, and uh, I interviewed 31 people for my memoirs, and she actually explained why I was suddenly sent back by my grandmother to my mother and stepfather, so, you know, uh, another traumatic period. And it would appear that my grandmother was worried about um, bringing up a young adult female on her own, um, thinking back to the experience she'd had with my mother, probably. Anyway, I got seven O levels. I still wanted to be a nurse. I became a school nurse assistant. And in the early 60s, uh, I applied from the Midlands to four London teaching hospitals. I had seven O levels, you can see. Um, all, all of them asked for the name of my father. I didn't know. Nobody spoke about my father. I mean, gradually I realized he must have been a different color from my mother. <laughs> and that was it. But I had my mother's maiden name, which is a very you know, Irish surname. Um, they asked for a, uh, my father's occupation, which I didn't know. And they asked for a photograph of me, which I sent. Was it one or all of these factors? that stopped any of them from replying to my application. School medical officer, who, looking back, was obviously a mentor, saw something in me, was horrified and angry. He gave me a reference for a hospital I, I did get into. And you've probably seen me here. Um, I don't know. Yeah, you've picked me out, haven't you? You're all very observant, yeah? If you haven't, talk to your neighbor, and they'll tell you. <laughs> so let's move on. Now, I, uh, uh, as you've heard from Sue's introduction, uh, ended up specialising in sickle cell and Mary Seacole. And I just want to flag up that in my um, three-year programme in the late 60s in Paddington, West London, I didn't get to hear about sickle cell, and neither did I get to hear about the Jamaican Scottish nurse, Mary Seacole, who was famous in the Victorian British media for her efforts in the Crimean War. Um, and uh, when I did find out about her in 1984, um, I, I, this anger in my belly, do you remember? It was still there, building up. Because actually I discovered that she was only buried not even a quarter of a mile away from where I trained as a hospital. Well, quite rightly, yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd learned about Florence Nightingale. I'm asking, how come we hadn't been told about Mary Seacole? What's going on here? 
Anyway, do you remember I said hair? So in the second year of uh, nursing, my friend, my Jamaican friend, realized I wasn't doing very well with my hair and frog marched me down the road to a Caribbean hair salon. And um, uh, it, it burnt my scalp and it was very expensive. But hey ho, I really thought I looked fantastic. <laughs> And so you've got an image, I, anyway, so I qualify. Now, we come to when I tried to, I've got a chapter where I call Becoming a Nurse But Not a Midwife. Now, in those days, in the late 60s, there was this thing about doing midwifery. Um, whether you wanted to practice it or not, you did your state registered nurse qualification, and then you did midwifery. Um, and so I tried to do midwifery I went to Scotland because I had this romantic view of Scotland. I still have a romantic view of some parts of Scotland. Um, and I went to Edinburgh, the Simpson Memorial Maternity Pavilion. And it was quite a contrast from the sort of laid back Paddington General. It was very hierarchical. Uh, there, were, there seemed to me thousands of medical students who got priority over the student midwives in terms of deliveries. Anyway, to cut a long story short, that's me. I didn't finish my midwifery course because of a really bad episode of bullying that I experienced. It was on the postnatal ward. It was um, an elderly primate. Do you still use that expression? Yes? Oh, my goodness. I think she was 28. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. And she had, was, had uh, huge difficulties um, uh, she wanted desperately to breastfeed. Anyway, between us, she did it. And she, however, she was very depressed, and she had an acute case of purple psychosis, got transferred to another unit outside of the unit. And, um, oh, uh, were you telling me my time's up, or were you just fiddling with the... <laughs> oh, sorry, OK. Anyway, I need to move on. But this is... I, 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 so what happened was the, the husband came and said, look, she's really improving. She'd like to see you. So I went to this unit, absolutely fantastic. She was recovering, went back to the postnatal ward, got hauled into the office by the sister. I didn't realize, but a friend of hers was at this psychiatric unit, and I contacted her and said I'd been to visit this lady. How dare you? Who gave you What? And I... This was the only one time I really had this experience of the black cloud. I don't know what Churchill called it, his black something, uh, black. Yeah. And I realized I, I was so depressed. And this woman was so unfair. And she just wouldn't allow me to explain why I'd gone to. And then there, uh, quickly, I'm quite logical, you know. I thought, she's not going to listen to me. If I just shut up, I decided, you're not going to listen, I'm going to tell you. But I walked out of that room so down. And anyway, I, I decided I didn't know what to do, except I knew I loved French, and I was going to French classes in Edinburgh. I happened to walk down the corridor, and the, the, the head of midwifery, Margaret Ald, who actually was quite iconic midwife, I later found out, she stopped me in the corridor. Now, she must have come and done, where are the student midwives in the room? Put your hands up. Oh, lovely, 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 hands down. Have you had the talk? You know, is it your first day? And somebody very, very important comes and talks to you. Well, we had that talk. I didn't know who she was. I later realized it was Margaret Ald. And she remembered me, stopped me in the corridor and said, what's the matter with you? Where's your, you don't look as cheerful as you used. I burst into tears. She took me to her office, sat me down, made me a cup of tea, got me to tell her exactly what had happened. And she said, right, you were right in what you did. I'll sort that, literally, this is what she said, I'll sort that sister out for you. Do you want to continue with your midwifery? And I said, actually, I want to be a health visitor. She said, look, oh, and I also want to go to Paris and work. She said, do you do that? I'll give you a reference. And I want to tell that story because I would never have expected somebody so senior, A, to be observant the way she was, secondly, to really pull me out of that depression and make me have belief in people again. So, you know, it comes from unexpected places. Look out for it, please. 
So I went to Paris, and very quickly, that's really where I became political. Um, what, what do I mean by that? Well, basically, I woke up to life. That's what being political is about. Um, I, had, I got very friendly with a French Benin midwife, and we were having coffee one day, and she said to me, Elizabeth, you all seem to be um, reading books. And I told her the story. Actually, I haven't told you the story. When I was in care, I washed my face 10 times with red Life Boy soap. What was that about? It was wanting to be like my friends. She said, have I, I, I'll move on from what, the, the background, but she, she said the book I should read was Black Skin, White Masks by Frantz Fanon. The title says it all. And when I read that book, it, the scales came off my eyes that really I needed to sort my own identity out. I didn't know who the heck I was. Internally, I felt this. Externally, I was being told I was something else. So these other images are just to show the impact of going to the States and learning about the civil rights, uh, meeting Angela Davis, etc. So basically, I wrote to my mother. Um, I'm now a health visitor, nearly 25, in London. And I said, tell me about my father. She did. She told me he was called Lawrence Odiata Victor Anion. He was a lawyer. He'd gone back to Nigeria. He visited me as a child. What she didn't tell me, which I discovered through uh, archive correspondence that the children's home um, gave me was actually they had got engaged and he'd gone back to Nigeria with the plan to bring my mum and me back when he was settled. It didn't work out. He got married and my mum got married. <coughs> so I didn't do anything with the information for three months. I didn't know any Nigerians. But then I realised I knew um, a, a lawyer, as it happened, from Sierra Leone in London. And he told me occasionally taught Nigerian law students. And he said, look, Elizabeth, I'll, I'll see if I can find out from them where your father's name comes from in Nigeria. That's all I was trying to find out. There was no Google at that point. So, okay. so Wednesday morning, I'm in my clinic in, in London, and John rang me. I've spoken to your father. I said, what? What, in Nigeria? He said, no, in Palmer's Green. That's North London. <laughs> To cut a long story short, I saw my father the next day, incredible, and he was recuperating from the Nigerian Civil War, the Biafran War, which he had been involved in um, as an advisor, uh, uh, and he, he, he was going, literally, this was June 1972, and he went back to Nigeria in, in November. So how lucky was I, all those things coming together? So you can see that um, he became a civil servant after practicing law and then became Nigeria's first ambassador to Italy and the Vatican. And I love my Irish family to bits, but look who got to meet the Pope. <laughs> Let's move on, some snapshots. And I only knew him for eight years. He died very young and it was very sad, but I, I had a wonderful relationship with him and he really uh, informed my, my career, um, which if you want to, I, I, Anyway, time doesn't uh, allow us to pursue that. My mother was gobsmacked that I met him and really pleased that it all turned out so well. And this, in fact, is the last photograph of, of my mum. She passed away a few weeks after this photo was taken, in fact. Now, um, very quickly, this, this is where the belly full of anger comes in because President Obama, in his own autobiography before he became president, talks about somebody else highlighting to him that he was carrying a lot of anger. And I think one thing, you know, I'm not similar to President Obama in all sorts of ways, but one thing that we share, I think, is that we've channeled our anger very positively. Um, I did it through um, my career and, and my voluntary work. Sickle Cell was in a dreadful state in the late 70s, and I was fortunate to come across and, and then work with um, Dr. Misha Brozovic, a consultant hematologist, and this, we both felt, we both were aware of the um, gaps in care for families affected by this genetic red blood cell disorder. Again, if you're on Twitter, NHS Twitter, at, at, at NHS, uh, they give it over to a guest curator each week. This week is an individual, a woman who has sickle cells, so maybe follow her tweets this week. It'd be very interesting. So, you know, gaps, 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 basically. And I then discovered from going to the States on holiday that actually nurses could play a role 
in provision of care within the multidisciplinary team in, in the States. And so I brought back this idea and um, Dr. Brosnick and I developed uh, this idea of the center. Um, hair, I hope you like the hair here. Now I know how to um, look after my hair. And it, you can see I have a foot in the health service, I've always had a foot in the health service and a foot in the voluntary sector. And the 16 year old girl became a professor of nursing, who knew? And I call my center after Mary Seacole because even in the late, seven, late 90s in West London, students still didn't know about Mary Seacole, neither did most of the tutors. And um, let's move on very quickly. I was invited to become part of the Mary Seacole Memorial Statue Appeal and just under 13 years it took us to raise three quarters of a million pounds to, raise, um, to erect this statue of Mary Seacole, which is in the gardens of uh, St. Thomas's Hospital. So if you haven't seen it, if you're ever in London, please do have a look. And I just want to finish with this photograph because it's my, it's the penultimate slide. It's my granddaughter. And uh, she'd been at the unveiling and then a few months later, she lives in Wales with my, my daughter, and she came and spent a few weeks with me um, for the summer holiday. And we were on the London Eye and all around Westminster. And I said, is there anything else you want to do? And she said, can we go and see Mary again? So I thought, you know, I could die and go to heaven because basically that's what we're all trying to do, prevent our children, grandchildren, our friends' children going through, experiencing the deficits that we went through. Oh, and then, aha, uh -huh, yes. <laughs> so let me, la last, little, last little story. Somebody asked me, why, why didn't you put Dame Elizabeth Annie on uh, for you? I said, well, I'd already published my book. Two months later, I got a letter saying, would you like to be a dame? And I thought, yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much for listening.